Hello everyone, it is Mr Clinton here and this revision session is intended for Year 11 pupils who have already studied Ozymandias and um, just want to revise it uh, for their GCSEs and then also maybe want to not just revise the poem but start to compare it to uh, another poem uh, too. Um, I assume this is mainly St Peter's students uh, listening to this YouTube video. However, if you're not from St Peter's, my name is Mr Clinton and my email address is down there. If you want to copy this presentation, uh, feel free to email me and I'll send you the presentation. So um, what we'll do today then is I'll remind you and talk you through the poem. I think the crucial thing is you understand basically the story of the poem, what's going on. Uh, and then we'll look at definitely good language techniques, structural techniques and the deeper meaning. Then to finish off, we'll then start to structure a comparative paragraph. And I'll show you how I would do that. And then at the end of it, by all means, the idea is that you will have a go at writing one yourself and using a range of quotations, techniques, connect this and also contextual references. So it's a little uh, revision just for, you, for yourself, really, a revision uh, technique now. Let's almost recall what your, your teacher has taught you. These four phrases on the board in different colours, what do they mean? I'll give you 30 seconds just to have a think about that. Let me pause the video and write those down. OK, if we start from the left and then sort of go around clockwise, a romantic poet. Remember, Percy Shelley wrote this poem. He's a romantic poet, a bit like William Blake, although he's writing in a different era. And romantic poets are interested in um, man or woman's role in the world and how it relates to nature. They're very interested in the individual. Ramesses is who um, inspired Percy Shelley to write this poem, if inspired is the right word, because Ramesses was an Egyptian pharaoh who was quite a tyrant. That's a good word to use, tyrant. I mean, pentameter is a structural technique. It is um, a five soft, five strong. Pent obviously means five, you know, for maths. And it's that, uh, it's ten syllables in each line. And it goes soft, strong, soft, strong, soft, strong. Imperative verbs is more of a language technique, and that is a command. So the poem itself, then I'll read it to you. <clears throat> In fact, I'll let you read it yourself. And then can you almost um, work out what is um, what is what, what what's actually happening in the poem? That's the first step. So I'll let you read that. And I'll also let you just read over that again and get your head around what the poem is about. And I'm going to talk you through it. OK, so first of all, it is um, uh, the persona is meeting someone that has been somewhere uh, an antique land. Maybe it is somewhere in uh, Africa or the Middle East, but probably um, probably Egypt and has seen this image to the right where it is a, a statue that is fallen into the decay. OK, and they see two vassalous, trunkless legs of stone. So the legs are there, but the trunk, the torso isn't. And it's in the desert. And on the sand, on the floor there is the, the visage, which means the face. And it's half sunk in sand and it's shattered. It's, uh, it's starting to decay and erode and it's broken, broken down. However, at this face, even though it's decayed, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. So this ruler is a tyrant, is an autocrat, is a despot, uh, is not uh, a kind and benevolent ruler, rules by fear and by violence. And it tells the sculpture, the sculpture has done a good job because all that sort of hate is stamped on this lifeless statue and uh, the hand that mocked them and the hand that fed. And I suppose uh, on a pedestal, so a little raised platform, there's a, like an inscription, like a little almost uh, name badge. And it says, my name is Ozymandias, if I'm pronouncing that right, maybe Oz Ozymandias, king of kings. So I wasn't just the king of Egypt or the king of uh, a particular part of Egypt. I was king of all the kings. I was the boss of all the bosses, most important person, most powerful person in the world. And look at my works, look on my uh, the cities that I've created, the slaves that I own, the slaves that have created these cities. And you uh, you should despair because I am a really evil, tyrannical ruler. However, after all that, nothing else remains. It's just boundless and bare. And in fact, the sands and the desert stretch far away and it's decaying. 
So although this person was really, really powerful, actually, now no one even knows who they are, who he is. And uh, nature has almost presided over this man-made statue. So a bit of context, I mentioned Percy Shelley was a romantic poet. Um, and the key, key thing is he's radical. And he's showing about the power of man and where mankind um, sort of uh, belongs in the grand scheme of things. He's seen this, uh, he'd been for a walk, I think, uh, one, one day. And he'd been to um, the British Museum. And he's seen this statue of Ramesses, Ramesses in the name for Ozymandias, Ozymandias. And he's seen uh, him and gone home and decided to write a poem about it. So once you've got your head around it, that's almost stage one. I think there's four stages. Stage two is look at language techniques and find your best quotes. And for quotes, I would go for those meaty quotations, quotations that are usually figurative languages. Uh, the kind of quotation that you can say the poet's use of metaphor or simile or personification or imperative verb or metaphor. That's what I'd be going for. And I personally would say these are the best four quotes to use. So what I do now is just spend a bit of time, pause this video and write down what is the image that is created? What does it make you think of? What is the poet's intention? What are the connotations of it? Stage three is structural techniques. So it is a sonnet, it is 14 lines. And if you have a quick count of, so the first line, how many syllables the first line is, I met a traveller from an antique land is 10 syllables. So it's 10 syllables, 14 lines, and that is a sonnet, and it's usually about love. Now there's not, it's not a, a lovey-dovey poem, it's not about um, a relationship, it's about self-love about a man who was very, very arrogant. So almost Shelley's been ironic there when he, when he, when he says it's a sonnet. It's I'm a bit to that, that those 10 syllables, and maybe that's an, an indication of control. So every time you pick a structural technique, you need to say, why? There's no good just technique spotting. We want to avoid that. You know, talk about the reason that the poet used I'm a bit pentameter. And the rhyme sort of works, doesn't it? Land and sand rhyme and command rhyme. And words like, I don't know, away and decay rhyme and bear and despair rhyme. But it's not really rhyming couplets, not really a, a consistent rhyme scheme. Therefore, it's disjointed. And maybe that shows also that things are disrupted and disjointed in society, perhaps, and that power can disjoint and disrupt things. And the significant last line is all about this man being powerful, arrogant, despot. And yet, right at the end, the lone and level sands stretch far away. No mention of Ozymandias. And that is significant because it's almost like he's now been forgotten. Power is finite. It is not infinite. It doesn't last forever. Now, what's the poem about? That's almost the, um, the fourth stage. First of all, get your head around the poem. Then look at language techniques and connotations of those, those phrases. Then look at the structural techniques and the connotations and the reasons why they'd be structured in that way. And finally, the big ideas. Well, it's definitely about power, um, but it's also about that power can be forgotten and power, no matter how powerful a person is at the time, it doesn't last forever. And things decay. And it's almost symbolic that this statue has decayed because Ozymandias has been forgotten about. And the key word really is transience. Power is temporary uh, and power can change. And nature is more powerful than man-made power. You know, those sands and the winds will continue forever. Osmandeus did not continue forever. Uh, and the answer is, which, which is those poems about? Well, the answer is all, all four things, really. It's about nature. It's about power. It's about despots. It's about um, decay. And it's about the, the nature of time, I would say. All are correct. There is no wrong answer there. And you can use whichever one you feel more comfortable writing about. In fact, you could write, start each paragraph with a different big idea, and that would definitely be a good technique to use. If you can combine that with a technique and talk about the transient power of nature and say he does this through a significant last line, even better. If you can talk about uh, uh, how things decay with a, a technique like a metaphor or uh, an imperative verb, even better. So here's what I would write about. You've got your head around the poem now. You know the poems very well. Your annotations, I'm sure, in your anthologies or in your revision guides are superb. But that's all very well. But how does that actually look on the page? How do you actually write about it? 
And I suppose this next um, part of the um, the presentation will be about actually writing about it. I would always start with you want like a point. Now maybe a teacher has said don't use PE, but you need to basically answer the question. That's what stage one, the topic sentence is about. Paris presented in the poem as transient, as temporary, as being uh, manipulated by despotic men. Then you need to use a short quotation to support that and embed that quotation. Use a short quote and you might say, you know, when Percy Shelley writes about the, the despot, he describes him as it might be a quote like cold command or it might be about uh, king of kings, whichever you choose. Then you use this sort of magic phrase, the poet's use of or Shelley's use of. And it might be imperative verb. It might be metaphor. It might be a uh, verb. Um, and then you explain why, what that connotation makes you think of. And at the end, you could sort of embed a bit of historical um, context about Ramesses or about biographical context about Percy Shelley being a, a romantic or about a literary uh, genre. And about uh, maybe you might even mention someone like William Blake, who was also interested in the role of man. And it would look something like this. Now, this is not about Ozymandias because the idea is you write about um, uh, a different poem yourself, or if you write about Ozymandias, I'll show you one about the prelude. So there is the answer. How is nature presented? It's serene and beautiful. My quote is like a swan. I just need to embed that. Where does that quote come from? When the boy first set sail, the, the poet is described as moving through the water like a swan. And you'd use a phrase like the poet's use of, or Shelley's use of, so the poet's use of, that's obviously a simile. And you put your ideas on there. What do swans make you think of? Purity, tranquility, they move gracefully, they move elegantly, and that's how the boat is moving. A bit of context. He's a romantic poet, therefore he's interested in nature. Simple as that. And I think that structure sometimes helps students very, very well. You do the same then with Osmandeus. The rule is presented as a, and then you put your quote in, Shelley's use of verb, and then a bit of analysis. What does it, what does it make? What do you associate with that word? What can it be argued as? And finally, a little bit of context. So that's poem one. That's what you would do to write about Osmandeus. Now, your choice of poem is up to you. What poem is also about power? And about rulers could use London. I mean, the, the ruler there isn't really named. It's sort of hinted at being uh, maybe blood runs down palace walls. It could be about the monarchy or it could be the power of just the government, perhaps. Or you might want to use the power of one particular man, such as um, such as my last duchess and that despotic uh, patriarch in the duke. What you do is you do exactly the same. Let's say right about Osmandeus for poem one. You write about poem two, let's say for this example, it's going to be My Last Duchess, and you structure it in exactly the same way. Now, if you're going for those top, top grades, the key thing is it's not two separate essays. You're not writing about Osmandeus and then My Last Duchess. I would write about Osmandeus and then My Last Duchess, and then bring it back to Osmandeus and then My Last Duchess. And then finally, you'd finish off writing about both poems in the same paragraph, maybe that structure. So it's really important that you always zigzag poem one, poem two, poem one, poem two, poem one, poem two. So what you can see on the screen there, you basically do that three times. However, it's not enough to do that. You need basically a, a topic sentence which links both poems. Of course, it's going to be connective. I would always start with both poems or both poets present power as, and you're focusing on that question. Now, the more uh, the ones you're really going for those top grades, those sevens and eights, don't always talk about power. Use synonyms for power. In fact, a good time to use a synonym for power might be halfway through when you bring in poem two. You know, similarly, um, Robert Browning also explores um, how how authority can be corrupted rather than saying power. And then right at the end, what I would do is evaluate. Yeah, they're both about power, but how are they different? How that you've always talked about how they're similar, but you need to say about poet one does this, but poet two focuses more on this. Or maybe you think one poem encapsulates power more than the other. That's where you sort of evaluate, and that's what will get you really, really high marks. So that structure you'll repeat uh, two more times, and ideally you write about uh, a method in those topic sentences too. It might be structural, 
might be linguistic, might be a language technique, might be uh, verbs, might be um, I admit pentameter, might be rhyme. I admit pentameter would be great if you're talking about London. What about this? Um, here I've got Osmandeus and my last at chess. And I'll give you time to look at those quotes. And in fact, look how well they link. Call command, I gave commands. We're talking about names there, Osmandeus and my 900 year old name. We've got talking about sort of gestures like hands and smiles. And you've actually got two artists. You've got a sculpture and you've got um, a painter. You've got to do about passion and it being really well represented in the in the sculpture or the or the painting. And the idea about vanity, I suppose, sneering and stooping. Now, they are all that is good to be able to do that. But can you actually look on the left hand side, link those? with a technique and a method give you a moment just to maybe pause this youtube video and annotate those maybe number the uh, techniques and number the quotes and link them and this is the answer yeah call commands i gave commands is alliteration and then we've got a simple sentence and declarative mode Again, we've got more declarations here. We've got a symbolic use of number. Got use of symbolism there. Yeah, degrading imagery. Got a symbolic character in both. Some imagery there, a simile. Some adjectives there that link well. And yes, yeah, sneer. Can be a symbolic noun. I suppose a sneer is almost a. Uh, it's a doing word, so I'd also say it's a verb, but definitely lots of similarities there. And are they similar or are they different? Well, they're 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 both a certain power, and uh, in, in both ways. So again, you can go for the same way and look for uh, comparisons there. So two paragraphs linked together. How do you do it? Let's have a read. Both presenters present powerful characters who believe they are superior to others. Shelley's use of the symbolic verb sneer on the visage of Ozymandias' statue suggests that he appears scornful of others. It could also reflect the attitude of Egyptian pharaohs who believe they were godlike and so might look down or sneer at all other people. That's your first paragraph about Ozymandias. And you can see there we're using mentioning the poet's name. We've got techniques in there. We've got a short quote. Uh, and we've got different layers of meaning. I'll probably say write two sentences per quote. Then we bring in a connective. Similarly, Browning's use of the declarative mode, I chose them to stoop, suggests that the Duke too thinks he's superior to all other people and has to bow to no one. And they're not using different techniques, but they're both having the same view, the same points. The adverb never could also suggest that the Duke is presented as so powerful, there is no possible circumstance in which he might be less important than the other person. So really what I've tried to do there is the bit in lowercase is about poem one, poem two, but it's really important, like I say, that it's a, a comparative paragraph. So that is why the topic sentence, you're talking about both poems and then you bring in that connective similarly. And you might also even bring in um, uh, a, syn a synonym for power like authority now here is what you're aiming for if you're one of the top students then yeah you're talking about both poems poem one then use a connective poem two what about this though can you add a paragraph at the end where you are evaluating and you're saying yeah they're both about power but which one is about power? How are they how are they slightly distinct? How are they different? And something like this would certainly hold you in good stead. However, Shelley presents Osmandeus as totally unquestioning his authority. While Browning's Duke can choose to demean others, while Osmandeus' sneer is unquestioned. This could suggest Osmandeus is more powerful as there are no limits or options to his power. When Osmandeus is controlling a whole nation, perhaps, whereas Browning is a patriarch and is effectively suppressing and oppressing and ultimately killing 
his partner, his wife. So to finish off, what I would do then is I would now, I think you've got a good understanding of the poem. Uh, stage two is language and structural techniques. And the, the fourth stage is putting that all together. Now, almost what you need to do before you go into that exam is deconstruct all that. And what I suggest you do now, what is fresh in your head, we're not looking at any quotes, close your poetry book, write down those three key quotes from Osmondeus, preferably with a linguistic or a structural technique in it. And then at the end, embed a couple of contextual references too. If you can then do that for uh, Miles Duchess or London or whatever poem you choose, even better. So the key thing really is, uh, as I'm sure your teacher uh, has taught you, and Mr. Chesterman has definitely taught St. Peter's students to do this, it's about um, interleaving. And you might be revising science for half an hour, but then you might go into English literature. And the way I would do it is clear everything away, get a post-it note out, get revision cards out, say, uh, give yourself a theme like power and write down key quotes from Osmandeus, key quotes from Miles Duchess, uh, key contextual references, and then see if you can remember those. So I hope you found this useful. Uh, like I say, uh, if you can pause it and re-watch uh, re certain sections, and then you're more than welcome to send me um, a practice paragraph uh, if you wish. So good luck and I look forward to hearing from you.